Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm Jonathan Zeitlin. I am the uh, academic director of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, uh, which is uh, sponsoring this uh, seminar. This is one of our uh, very first seminars of the uh, academic year 2021-2022. Uh, Here we're still in, uh, in virtual format and happy to welcome people from beyond Amsterdam. As a result, gradually we may move also mm -hmm. to uh, physical meetings and maybe hybrid ones because we really like having the, uh, the colleagues from outside Amsterdam who can uh, participate in our events. And I'm very happy to welcome uh, Yale Tosin. Um, she is Professor of Political Science at the University of Heidelberg uh, in Germany. She has a pretty broad research agenda um, focusing on the comparative study of regulation in areas of environment, energy, and climate change, as well as on distributive conflicts within the EU and the influence of the EU on regulation uh, in third uh, countries. But actually, I would say her uh, research agenda is even broader than that. And it, come, it brings together, let's say, public policy, um, politics and public opinion, and political economy um, at, di at different uh, scales. I will mention that um, uh, she's the new, I, I just received a notice that she's the, the new chair of the Council for European Studies, Territorial Politics and Federal, Federalism Research Network. And I see you're also the editor in chief of a new journal called Climate um, Action. Um, I mean, I myself uh, came across your work uh, in the context of the, the politics and policy of pesticides and GMO uh, regulation, which I and some uh, colleagues in ACES are working on in different uh, contexts. Um, and it was very interested to see that, you know, you really could link the policy debates to um, both public opinion, but also to voting in uh, comatology committees, which are, is actually not public. So you had to do some, uh, some reconstruction and original research to, to find out what, of course, should be public knowledge, which is how member state representatives uh, have voted on things like uh, authorization of pesticides and, uh, and GMOs. But, um, you know, when I came to look at um, your portfolio of work, I see that you work on uh, water governance, on education, training, and skill formation. You're also the uh, co-editor recently of the Routledge Handbook of Policy Styles, and you have a, a textbook on public policy with Christoph uh, Knell. So it's, it's an impressive um, uh, portfolio and intersection of activities, of, of lines of research, and we do hope to bring you to Amsterdam in person um, uh, if circumstances permit as a visiting scholar in residence sometime in the spring. And today you've given us a, you're gonna present a, a new paper in progress with Daniel Bellon and Yanis Papadopoulos, uh, which is on the indirect effects of direct democracy on policy change. And, uh, looking particularly at the European Citizens Initiative, uh, which was introduced by the Lisbon Treaty, and on which there is not really a lot of, uh, of literature to date. So I'll hand it over to you. You're going to talk, as I understand it, for about half an hour, and then we'll open up to questions. And people can either uh, you know, uh, post their questions or their desire to speak in the chat. You can put your virtual hand up um, in the participants list. And uh, I, I'm very happy to let people put their um, cameras on if they feel able to do so and ask their questions live as opposed to um, uh, just my reading out the question as in a, in a webinar. So uh, Yala, the, uh, the Zoom screen is yours. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you've been too generous um, in like it, with your introduction. I 
think, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be the one who's opening this series, actually. This is great. So um, now I'm going to share my screen with you, and hopefully it will work out fine. If there's any problem with the presentation, please do let me know. I just have to wait for a second that I can switch to the presentation mode, and then we should be ready to go. Okay. So, um, yes, as we already learned, uh, today's talk uh, will focus on um, the European Citizens Initiative as uh, one instrument which exists um, to increase the level of direct democracy in the European Union. There are certainly other ones, um, but it's the most recent one. It was just introduced with the Lisbon Treaty, and it only became operational um, two years after the Lisbon Treaty actually went into effect in 2012, uh, because there was no, no regulation in place for how it would be implemented. So it is a relatively recent um, political tool, um, but it's not only because of that that I take an interest in the European Citizens Initiative, and hopefully you will share my enthusiasm with me as we progress with this presentation. So um, the paper which um, I, I can share uh, with you today um, is actually um, part of a special issue um, project um, which focuses on transformative change. So um, the special issue is interested in, um, in the politics of transformative change. So how transformative change can be actually brought about. And um, I must admit, and I thought it's worth addressing this uh, right from the beginning, um, that I'm always a bit uneasy with this with this notion of transformative change, um, because like it, it sounds very ambitious. It is it is very ambitious actually, but once you try to operationalize what it is actually about, and then if you if you think this through in terms of like what types of policies are needed, um, things become pretty pretty complicated. Um, and it's also not always conducive for analytical purposes to take this at face value. And sometimes it's uh, it's better if you decompose this this notion of transformative change. But uh, but this is pretty much the, the overarching phenomenon which is supposed to, um, to tie together the individual contributions to that special issue. And what is meant by transformative change? Um, so it, it has gained currency certainly, so um, the sustainable development goals are intended uh, to bring about transformative change um, in the way how we how we actually address issues and the major feature of the sustainable development goals is not only that they are very broad they cover many sectors but also that the sectors are supposed to be integrated so that you have one coherent set of policies which um, and this would be the least um, ambitious interpretation do not um, cancel out each other, but in the best of all worlds, they would even mutually enforce each other. And the European Green Deal, um, and the European Green Deal will pop up um, in, um, in the subsequent parts of the presentation, is the, 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 the strategy the European Union has adopted to bring about a transformation formative change. So it resonates uh, directly with the sustainable development goals, um, but there are some, some special um, well, aspects about it which, which are EU specific and which are not directly reflected by the sustainable development goals, but, uh, but they certainly uh, correlate very strongly with each other. So uh, when we talk about transformative change, um, there are many ways how we can think of, of bringing about transformative change um, in, when we look at the political process. And what we want to do with this paper is that we want to introduce the citizen's perspective. This is actually not so new. Um, Teresa Kuhn has also worked uh, a bit on this, um, but also many others. Um, citizens are acknowledged by the European Union, and there's also this term of the European Union citizenship. And uh, with the Energy Union, for example, which was introduced in 2015, um, I found this actually quite surprising back when, when I read it the first time. The, the Commission was very explicit in mentioning uh, citizens and the role of citizens uh, for delivering the European Energy Union, like saying that citizens are at its core, that it is about the ownership of energy transition, 
then that they should benefit from, um, citizens should benefit from, uh, from the energy union and energy transition. There should be more participation and they should be protected. And from this quote, you see that um, citizens naturally are the target of policy action. This is also how they are mostly discussed in the context of comparative public policy. Um, what you find more often uh, in comparative politics is that citizens um, play a role in, uh, to the extent that they dis express their content or discontent with policies in elections. That's the famous literature by Müller and, and Ström, for example. And then um, there's this third role that citizens um, actually play in political processes. And that's the one on which this presentation and the corresponding paper is about. It is on the role of citizens in demanding and also proposing alternative policies. And um, this is actually a, a perspective which has been taken up by democracy um, scholars, um, also people working on Swiss politics, very naturally also, again, have elaborated a lot on this, but in the comparative public policy perspective, this third um, aspect has, has received rather scant attention. And this is what we want to change with this paper. And we're looking at uh, one specific type of, um, of um, an instrument that is supposed to, um, to facilitate citizens to propose alternative um, policies, and that's the European Citizens Initiative. And here I'm just showing you a few random examples. So there's currently one on bees and farmers. It's um, still ongoing. So in case you're, you're interested in this topic, make sure um, to, to check it out and to sign if you're interested by, by the end of this month. Um, there's the very famous one uh, called Right to Water, which has uh, not only attracted quite some, some academic attention, but also, as I will show, um, political attention. Um, there are other ones which have been successful, and I'm going to explain what this means, um, but which were not so uh, well received in the media, such as the Minority Safe Pack Initiative. And then there's another one on um, demasking food, uh, which was completed two years ago, and the Commission still has not issued um, a final evaluation of it. So um, it's like to, to a regular citizen, it's still not clear whether they have to collect the necessary number of signatures or not, so as the status itself is pending, uh, which indicates that um, it takes some time also from the side of the Commission to analyze these citizens' initiatives and then to process them. Um, how, how do these citizens' initiatives uh, function? So first of all, um, we should be aware that these are not initiatives uh, that you find, for example, in Switzerland, in a sense that you propose um, a legal bill on which people vote, but it's rather an agenda, set, agenda setting instrument. Um, it's a tool that is used by European citizens to call for action, but in a rather broad way. So like stop something or do something, that's kind of the, the level at which they are formulated, but it does not specify um, like, specific policy instruments usually. So it's, it's not a, a legislative bill um, on which people vote, but it's more uh, an, a call for policy action or for stopping policy action, both is possible. And how does this start? So um, first of all, you need to form a, a citizens um, committee, which must comprise at least seven individuals um, who are based in at least seven EU member states. And they have to um, they have to file um, their initiative, and the Commission then decides whether to register the initiative or not. The Commission is not forced to register um, an initiative. So, if it is on a topic which does not lie within the competence of the European Union, it can um, abstain from doing so, or it can refuse to do so. Um, and also, if there are some ethical um, doubts, the Commission can also refuse to register an initiative. And once um, an initiative is registered, it appears on the website of the European Citizens Initiative. And this is when the real work actually starts, at least for the organizers, because they have one year to collect at least 1 million signatures. Um, 
And these signatures must be distributed in a way that the quorums are met in at least seven member states. Um, sounds like one million does not sound like too many um, signatures, like comparing it to, to, the, um, to the population size of the European Union. But since you have like these uh, thresholds for the individual states, it's actually quite tedious. And it's also difficult to keep an, uh, an issue on the agenda for one year. Um, this is actually something I learned by speaking to, um, to students from Wageningen who organized a citizens initiative on genome editing. Um, it's called Grow uh, Science, uh, and um, and it's actually uh, it was quite fascinating talking to them because they explained to me well it sounds so easy in the beginning but then uh, we were we it was quite a sobering experience to to uh, to when we started to collect these um, these signatures but that's really the tricky part to gain the support and. All the subsequent steps are actually not relevant if the organizers didn't uh, manage to to um, to gather the the one million signatures. Um, so steps four to six um, are only are reserved for for the so-called successful initiatives that manage to meet that threshold. And what happens next? So there is um, a procedure for verifying that the votes are valid. Um, the initiative is then formally submitted and, uh, and the organizers are invited to, um, to present the initiative in the European Parliament. There is um, an exchange with the European Commission and then, and this is actually the formal ending of, um, of the citizens initiative, uh, the successful initiatives get a formal answer from the Commission explaining why it took action or why it abstained from taking action. But that's pretty much it. It's quite a lot of work for, um, for receiving a letter in the best of all cases. At least this is like, if, if we look at the, at the bare facts here. Um, here um, you can see how um, the number of citizens initiatives um, filed with the European Commission developed over time. Um, so in the beginning, um, it, it, there was also no clear procedure and, and some uncertainty. Therefore, um, there was a bit of um, um, a decrease in the beginning um, and also over the last few years. But then there was actually a pretty steep increase uh, between 2018 and uh, 2019. That had also a lot to do with um, the, the Fridays for Future movement and also having some um, sustainability related topics, which which became pretty pretty popular back then and also pesticides by the way um, um, that that is when uh, with the with the stop glyphosate initiative or the the renewal of the of the glyphosate authorization um, citizens became really interested in um, in using the European level to uh, express their discomfort with what the commission is doing or what it is or what the commission is not doing and then there was a steep decrease in 2020 but I I don't have the numbers for this year in this graph, but this improved again. So it's a bit of an up and down, which is, is, is a regular picture, not only for this kind of initiatives, but also in, in the national or subnational contexts. But no clear pattern. So it's not nothing where you can see that a skyrocketing took place or, or plummeting or something like that. It's rather a, a fluctuating pattern. Um, so research so far has mostly concentrated on the question how democratic the European Citizens Initiative is, and there's absolutely great work out there um, by Justin Greenwood, for example, and many others who have elaborated on, well, yeah, is this really a tool to, to reduce the, the democracy gap in the European Union or the democracy deficit? Um, but I, I, I took an interest in the European Citizens Initiative for, for other reasons, so I'm, I'm certainly not elaborating on the democracy aspect, but in the past I focused, as also Jonathan kindly explained, on the narrative uh, strategies of, uh, of the campaign. So together with Frederic Varon, we, we took a look at issue linkage, also as an indicator for, um, for mobilization strategies. And we looked at the Stop Glyphosate Initiative and whether the initiators try to establish a connection between glyphosate and GMOs. With, together with Simon Schaub, we took a look at narrations and I will give you a snapshot of that, that paper uh, on the next slide. And with another colleague, we, we, we took a look at uh, German election manifestos to see whether right to water was uh, was received by German political parties and there you see actually an interesting pattern that left-wing parties 
keep referring to right to water to uh, to explain that they're against privatization, whereas the right wing parties, it never resonated with them, which is perfectly plausible. But this is also where my comparative politics uh, interest again comes in. And, uh, and then there's this perspective, which we are trying to address with this paper, but which has also been addressed, um, but by using different lenses in the, in the literature, which focuses on the political consequences of the, um, of the European citizens initiatives. And to the best of our knowledge, but please do correct us, um, the, 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 the existing research has mostly focused on the EU level. So the, the, the research is mostly on what were the effects of European citizens initiatives on EU level policies. Um, there's an excellent um, research paper by Candila and also her, her uh, PhD thesis on this topic, for example. But, uh, but what we want to do with this paper is also to, 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 um, to acknowledge the fact that the European Union is a multi-level system and that the effects uh, do not have to be limited to the EU level, but that they can also trickle down and induce some policy reactions at, at the um, at the other levels that constitute the, this complex system. Uh, as I just mentioned, um, this is um, just very, very brief uh, um, impression or from, uh, from the paper which uh, I co-authored with Simon Schaub, where we looked at these narrative strategies to see uh, whether over time there has been a difference in the, in the strategies the organizers of the European citizens initiatives use. So in the narrative policy framework, there are these two um, main strategies that, um, that advocacy organizations can use. One is the so-called devil shift, where you over exaggerate the power of the opponents and depict them as evil. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this corresponds to lighter colors here, white or a light gray in this um, in this graph or whether they also engage in something which is called uh, an angel shift where they present where the organizers present themselves as the heroes that they have the only solution to fix a given problem uh, which is a more recent strategy and um, as you can also see it's not as common as this this more established strategy of a devil shift and um, so the angel shift that's mostly this, this black bit or the dark gray color um, it fluctuates also a bit over time but a very dedicated commitment to angel shift is not as uh, marked as the the devil shift for example which shows that this is this is also the the main strategy of the organizers of european citizens initiatives but that's certainly something uh, we can talk about later if you're interested in this narrative policy framework I, I kind of wanted to give you a bit of a broader overview of my work on this on this phenomenon so um Let's turn to um, the role citizens' initiatives can have for bringing about policy change. So as I said, this paper is very much thought from the perspective of comparative public policy. And in comparative public policy, citizens and also citizens' initiatives are not very prominent explanatory variables. Um, so most of the research focuses on veto points. Actually, it is veto points um, and not veto players. Veto players, again, is, is more comparative politics uh, notion or it's rather used in, in that work. So the veto point notion dominates uh, if research elaborates on citizens' initiatives at all. So as an impeding factor to, to policy change, um, there's something I must admit frankly that we still need to think through. It may be that the citizens' initiatives are actually kind of thought um, as part of, of advocacy coalitions, um, but that's something we definitely need to, 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 to um, explore in detail um, in the next weeks to come. Um, those of you who are familiar with the policy process theories may know that there is this very, very influential concept of advocacy coalitions. And it could be that they just go as one component of, uh, of advocacy coalitions. But I don't, I'm not aware of a study that has like differentiated um, the, the, the composition of advocacy coalitions and has referred to, to citizens' initiatives explicitly. But that's something uh, we, we can also discuss later on. So we have this perspective, this analytical perspective in comparative public policy, which from our understanding stands at odds uh, with what is actually 
happening in the world. So in the real world, you see that citizens' initiatives are becoming more prominent. They are implemented more frequently, even in countries such as Germany, where the formal requirements for citizens' initiatives are rather high. And I will uh, give you an example on the next slide for that. So building on, um, on the literature on the European uh, citizens' initiatives, we thought we, we should look at the European citizens' initiatives because they are associated with having no effect or very, very limited effect on, on political processes. So we chose the European version of the citizens initiatives as the hardest case, if you wish, for, for observing um, policy change. So we would actually not expect to, to observe a European citizens initiative induced policy change, at least if we follow the literature. And so we thought, well, if we see some indication of this there, probably we can expect that in other multi-level systems, there could be even more, more um, citizens initiative policy change. So that was kind of the rationale why we, why the, we chose the European citizens initiative. Um, and it's also important as a disclaimer. So this paper is not a paper on um, praising the citizens initiative. Um, there are certainly aspects of it that, that, that should be uh, seen critically, but it is really one that is interested in, in the mechanisms underlying it in terms of what it could do to bring about policy change or not. Um, as I briefly mentioned, and I, I'm, I'm giving this example because I, I know of this, this fantastic study you've carried out in Amsterdam on pesticides. So pesticides have become a pretty, pretty big thing in Germany for citizens initiatives. Um, in, in Germany, there, there was a first citizens initiative on pesticides in Bavaria, and then there was a horizontal diffusion of citizens initiatives. Um, spreading to Baden-Württemberg, the state where I live, um, to Brandenburg, Niedersachsen, and actually there's also um, North Rhine-Westphalia, which also now has a, such a citizens initiative in place, where, um, where groups of citizens actually ask um, pesticides to be banned, to increase organic farming, and, um, and also ask other uh, for other measures to increase or to protect biodiversity. I just wanted to mention this because um, we have also that initiative at the Europe European level, but in parallel, we have an interesting movement in Germany that at the state level, you have a lot of um, activism for stricter uh, pesticide policies. So um, the argument of the paper is as follows. Um, it's not an explanatory model in a narrow sense. It's, it's more a conceptual paper, because like we know from the work by, by Greenwood, but also most importantly by, by the work by Marco Juni, that um, public opinion is critical for the success of citizens' initiatives, but also having political allies. Uh, so the, the, the argument made in the literature on social movements is it's not the citizens' initiative per se, but it is rather um, that it is rather citizens' initiatives plus something else. And, um, and this kind of aligns with what we are thinking. What we are doing in this paper is to make this argument that we need to reconsider our conceptualization of policy change, which can potentially be brought about by citizens' initiatives in the sense that we, that we advocate a more refined uh, take on this. So we think um, it's, it's not always this kind of immediate major policy change at the EU level that European citizens initiatives bring about, but we should take into consideration that policy change takes time, so there can be time lags, especially if you think through this idea that you need to have a favorable public opinion, but also powerful political allies. This may be um, available at the time when the citizens initiative is implemented, but it could also be the case that these just evolve so that the public opinion changes, for example, or that the political allies just become powerful um, after a certain time. So we think to appreciate the, the policy effects of uh, European citizens initiatives, we need to consider potential time lags. And what we also um, argue is we need to, to take into account the multi-level structure of the European Union in a sense that policy impacts uh, are not limited to the EU level only. They can also materialize at the national level or at the sub-national level. So that's effectively the argument we are making. And we came up with this, and I think it's fair to call this a descriptive model, 
um, because it's it's rather an, an overview of, of outcomes than of, of explanations. And by the way, one which I just modified this morning because I added the, the, uh, the time scale and um, the horizontal time scale, um, which was absent. I just noticed that it should be in there. So I added that uh, for those who, who have already read the paper or want to read the paper, just to, to give you a better understanding of the modification I made. And um, what, what we want to show with, with this illustration is, um, so you have a European citizens initiative um, to begin with. It can induce direct policy change. This is outcome one. So a direct response to it. This was, for example, the case um, with the right to water. Um, there were actually several policy responses to right to water, but I will turn to, to them um, on the subsequent slides. But um, a European citizens initiative can also immediately bring about no change, but perhaps bring about change um, with a certain time lag. Uh, which is also something we can see, for example, with the uh, with, uh, uh, right to water, but there are also other examples. So this is kind of, the, so the first two outcomes refer to um, policy change that takes place in response to a European citizens initiative. One refers to immediate change and the other one to a time lagged change. Moving on, we have outcome number three, which is that a European citizens initiative could perhaps not bring about changes at the EU level, but it may induce policy change at the national level. And uh, it could also be the case that we, so, that we have a, a failed attempt or no policy change at the EU level, but one, but a, a national reaction, um, which is kind of a direct reaction to the fact that nothing has happened at the EU European level. So outcome three is, um, is a non-conditional response, whereas outcome four is a conditional response in the sense that the national level uh, decides to take action because there was no action by the European Union. I'm not so sure whether we, we have explained this sufficiently well in the paper, but that's the idea. <laughs> And turning to, uh, to outcome five and six, now we, we, we are looking at the subnational level. And here again, it could be the case that the subnational level reacts to a European citizens initiative, just uh, regardless of the outcomes um, that took place at the EU level. Likewise, uh, there could also be an instance of policy change because there was no um, policy change at the EU level or at the national level. So again, it would be a conditional logic. Um, I must admit, I'm, I, I think th this figure needs further updating and clarification, but I'm, I'm sure you'll have great suggestions for that. This is what we kind of think in terms of outcomes here. So as I mentioned, outcome one would be policy change at the EU level, taking taking place at like with without too much uh, time and uh, time delay right to water is a, is a good example for this because the commission withdrew um, uh, its um, original proposal of the concessions directive with a little bit more of a time lag the drinking water directive which was just adopted I think about a year ago or actually it entered into force about a year ago is a good example because it even explicitly refers to right to water and that it wants to improve uh, universal access to water because of the citizens initiative. Maybe a better example could be end the KHH, uh, which has a very, very immediate uh, policy uh, um, impact and which is a bit more immediate than it was also the case with right to water. Outcome two, an example for this, for a delayed policy change at the EU level would be People for Soil, uh, which called for a European Soil Framework Directive, which was taken up by the European Parliament and now the Commission has launched a consultation. So this is now happening actually with a delay of, I think, six years, five to six years. Um, outcome three, uh, an example for that, where we have policy change at the national level, um, Plus policy change at the EU level is um, that the Czech Republic banned caged hens um, in anticipation that there would be a European rule. Outcome four um, is a policy change at the national level. 
as a reaction to the fact that there was no policy change at the EU level, that stopped glyphosate and the national bans that were instituted. Luxembourg did that, also Austria, but it never took effect because of um, formalities. Outcome five is, um, is stop TTIP and how the Walloonian government used it to improve his, uh, its uh, conditions um, in, in, with the CETA agreement. And outcome six, and I'm happy to elaborate in greater detail on this um, in the Q&A. Outcome six, where we have subnational level policy change as a reaction to a failed attempt to produce policy change at the national or at the European level is stop glyphosate um, in France, where we had mayors uh, instituting local bans. Just to give you some examples. So all these case studies provide uh, explanations for why these um, initiatives brought about policy change. A recurring feature is um, that they were most impactful when the European attempts were paired with national attempts, so national or subnational citizens initiatives. And what we find interesting is that when you use this refined uh, way of thinking about the effects of uh, European citizens initiatives, even seemingly unsuccessful citizens initiatives, that means those that failed to reach the 1 million signatures brought about policy changes, sometimes with delay and not always at the EU level, but, but something happened in, in subsequent to, to these initiatives. And, um, and just to, to, to support um, a finding in the literature, I mean, these initiatives are most effective if they are accompanied by other facilitating factors. Um, political allies always help, uh, for example, but as I just mentioned, um, also national initiatives help because they make the pressure on policymakers much more direct and much more urgent. So to conclude, um, I'm making a player here that the role of citizens deserves more attention in comparative public policy in particular, and uh, that a more granular conceptualiz conceptualization of what the potential effects of citizens' initiatives in general, but European citizens' initiatives in particular are, is, is helpful um, to detect more instances of policy change. Usually it's the other way around, I, I thought, when I prepared the slides. Usually it is the, the, the rougher the measurement, the more you find something, but here it's the other way around. The more refined, the more you, you, you find something. And, um, and it, but it's a complex relationship. Um, many of the points already discovered in the literature seem to hold, but also like when you use the more granular perspective, um, the, the, the causal relationships also become more complex and this certainly requires much more systematic uh, in, investigation than what I could have offered here for, for this talk today and also in this paper and that's as a line of inquiry I want to uh, follow up with in my, in my future projects. Thank you so much for your attention and for giving me a chance to present this and now I look forward to your questions and comments. So I'll stop here. For some reason, I think uh, Jonathan has uh, disappeared. <laughs> um, so uh, I just saw him before. So I think there must be some technical issues. So maybe I just take over for the moment. That's fine. Thank you very much, Jana, for a really interesting talk. Um, this was uh, super insightful, and especially also that you gave some more broader um, information about citizens' initiatives, because it's, I think, from what I see, a relatively new field. Um, are there any questions from the audience at this moment? Um, not yet. I, I think there is some technical issue because I see people. Yeah, no problem. Announced. No problem. <laughs> Uh, let me just uh, maybe start with some questions. So um, I think it, I really enjoyed your talk because it does touch upon, and you mentioned my name at some point, it does touch upon research that I do, but I actually never really engaged with it myself. So um, this was very um, insightful for me to, to learn a lot about uh, um, yeah, this way of citizen involvement. Um, I have a couple of more general questions mm -hmm. about um, 
citizen initiatives um, and again saying that it is something that I'm really interested in but I haven't really studied it myself so maybe some of the questions even seem a little bit you know uh, very basic to you but um, I was wondering to what extent um, you, you can make a distinction into who actually or what kind of citizen in initiatives are there mm -hmm. in terms of um, political ideology but also in terms of um, so left-right ideology, but maybe mm -hmm. pro versus anti-European. Because um, my hunch would be that uh, Europe, you know, that people who are able to engage at the European level and to kind of also connect with other Europeans in order to have these um, the uh, amount of member states included must be highly educated transnational people so more cosmopolitan people on the one hand mm -hmm. and my hunch would also be at least mm -hmm. from the examples that you brought that they are all much more on the progressive left-leaning side mm -hmm. so my question here would be whether uh, this is something that you can confirm and then also um, whether you know something about there is a structural uh, connection with how effective they then are whether you could you know there is evidence that for example those more on the left leaning side actually get more uh support mm -hmm. and i see that jonathan is back yeah yeah i'm so i'm sorry i don't know what happened I, at least my connection crashed did everybody's connection crash or just mine no just yours but uh, there was a some came back again at some other point so yeah i think it was mainly you <laughs> so i took over <laughs> Well, welcome to, back. Uh, yeah. But good that you stepped into the brief. Oh, she did. She did for sure. Yes. Um, it may, do, may I take the question directly or shall yeah, we collect? Why, why, why not? Why not? Indeed. Okay. Well, actually, so, uh, so fantastic questions. So first of all, um, I, the, the, these, these uh, initiatives have changed over time. So in the beginning, you could really see like the organizers were not very professional. They also came up with some very weird uh, initiatives also to kick out uh, Switzerland from the Schengen area, for example. So you also had this kind of initiative um, or to stop citizens movement with, 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 uh, uh, with Switzerland. Uh, but you can see, and that's actually a point Greenwood makes, they, be, they have become more professional. Uh, and so, um, I mean, there have been some anti-EU um, initiatives, certainly, uh, but I would say it's not being pro or anti-EU, but it is rather, they want to have a different kind of the European Union, for example, one which is less open to globalization, for example, right? I mean, this is always the case with, with, um, with direct democracy. I mean, only those who disagree not with the concept of the European Union as such, but with how the European Union materializes or acts, they become active. And well, it depends. So the, the initiative from Wageningen I mentioned, these were PhD students in, in molecular biology. And this was their attempt. They wanted to create a non-biased science-based uh, discourse on genome editing. And they failed because this is not how you mobilize people. It, I mean, you need to you need to invoke emotions. You need to create pictures. You need to tell a story, right? And and when I when I talked to them, they, they they actually agreed and they said, no, this is definitely nothing we tried to do. So we just wanted to present the facts. I would say this is the they're a, a minority group among the citizens' initiatives, but it is mostly those who. Um, I would not say they they disagree with the European Union. So it's not this anti. It, so it's not. A, a, um, a dismissive stance on the European Union, but it is rather an attempt to transform the European Union or to change the European Union or certain policy positions. And in terms of ideology, I would agree. Um, there's actually a good indicator uh, for whether it's rather supported by, by left-wing groups or not. Um, these campaigns to be successful, they rely a lot on the platforms that promote them, like for example. But in Germany, and I think there are similar uh, platforms also in other countries, there's, for example, Campact. And if Campact supports you, this is really like the anti-capitalism, anti-globalization platform if they support you that's almost a very that's a very reliable indicator that this is more left leaning i would say but with others it's it's less clear i think there's there's tremendous variation in in what they cover also in terms of 
um, how professional they are. I would say as a rule, they have become more professional over time. Um, and uh, and this is also what Greenwood says, and he, um, that, that they have become more professional. And also that the EU is now increasingly actually used by, by groups that were formerly active at the national level only, but now they move to the European level because they feel they can they have more impact there. So they practice venue venue shopping. But to be honest, uh, uh, this would be that, that's one one line of inquiry. I would I would be thrilled to continue to see whether left wing initiatives are more successful if you have left wing parties parties or politicians or governments in place something like that like the, the the you could i think nicely build on this political uh, alliance uh, thing here I, well i take it more as a suggestion than as a question or a comment thank you so much <laughs> so i saw several people who mm -hmm. had hands up i mean first i saw evans fanulis but now your hand is down so i don't know whether you still want to ask a question uh, and then Anna Kandira, I have some questions and comments myself, but I can take them out. Right. So what I would say is, uh, if people can put on their camera, please do so. Say a word to identify yourself, you know, uh, where you're from and what you've been doing. Uh, Anna Kandira has already been cited by in the presentation by Yala. But first, we'll start with uh, Evans Fanulis, if uh, I assume it's a he wants to... Um, to come in. So you need to, um, to, to, to unmute and uh, ideally put your camera on. I did unmute myself. I'm not sure whether you can hear me loud and clear. Yeah, we're doing fine. We don't okay. see. Okay. So I would suggest. No, you're gone. I'm sorry. My camera because actually, I mean, uh, sorry. Just keep your camera off, but just say a word about yeah. it. I um, mean, I was just saying that I'm in China. This is why it's uh, at the moment quite difficult to switch on the camera because it's about like 11 o'clock and I'm about to collapse. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm an assistant professor in international relations at Xi'an Chiatong Liverpool University here in China. And I'm also working on EU democratic politics uh, with a very much, in I'm very interested in citizen participation. So mm -hmm. this is more or less what I'm doing, but I'm doing that from an agonistic democracy perspective. Um, and uh, I was w following your very interesting presentation and I have a, a first quick question is how you control about other factors mm. that they may affect and they might relate to this policy, mm -hmm. policy changes. Um, it, this might be more or less part of your follow-up research. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, what I found very interesting is that when you were talking about these unsuccessful initiatives and how they may actually create policy change uh, that is quite transformative, um, I was wondering, the, um, especially when it comes to the ones that they are unsuccessful because they have not uh, managed to reach this threshold of one million signatures, right? Um, and then you said that they were actually trying to get in this idea of policy change and push their public demands by means mm -hmm. of uh, coalescing with political allies. Can you tell us a bit more mm -hmm. about what kind of political allies we're talking about? That? Uh, yeah. Are we talking about national actors? Are we talking members of the European Parliament? Are we talking about specific DGs within the European Commission? So if you can give us more information yeah. that might be already in the paper, but with apologies, I mean, we start, we start teaching very early here in China, so it's already week two, and I didn't manage to read the paper, but I, I promise I will as soon as, uh, as possible. Thank you very much. A very interesting paper, a very interesting piece of research. Thank you, Evans, uh, for being so committed. And I feel really flattered that you stayed up all the time just to listen to this talk. Um, well, from a methodological viewpoint, this is indeed tricky, to be honest. And um, that's also the reason why um, if, if, I, well, if we were to do this at a more comparative, systematic way, I mean, measurement would definitely become a key issue because like, we only looked at initiatives where, um, where acts associated um, with, the, with the topic of the European Citizens Initiative explicitly referred to a European Citizens Initiative. So, the, um, so there is a, a resolution by the 
European Parliament, for example, on the Soil Framework Directive, and there they explicitly refer to the, um, to the citizens' initiative on this. But um, this does not mean that it was really the citizens' initiative that induced this process, right? It could just be that they mention it to increase legitimacy or for all sorts of strategic reasons, right? Uh, I mean, it's not that we can we can fully capture the, the causal mechanism here so that it is the citizens' initiative and then it has some effect. And that's definitely a caveat. That's also something we, we need to um, discuss more upfront uh, in the paper, uh, but it's tricky. Um, so the cases we used here um, are the ones for which we had at least one source, uh, either primary source or secondary source creating this relate this connection. Um, but that's a methodological challenge, I must admit that. And in terms of the political allies, so we just talked about um, people for soil. Um, they act, they proactively approach the European Parliament. So, um, so they, that's also something um, you have, I mean, if you think of this in terms of advocacy coalitions, I mean, the organizers of these initiatives are, are usually, they have their networks because otherwise they also could not organize these uh, initiatives, right? I mean, you have to bring an issue on the agenda, keep it there for, for a year in, uh, in, in a number of EU member states. So usually they have some background, they have some networks and they oftentimes also have some connections with, with uh, politicians. And, um, and, and, and I think you can see that the political parliament in particular has kind of become the natural ally of, um, of these citizens' initiatives, not all of them, but some of them. Also with, with bland, uh, bland glyphosate, which did not produce policy change at the European level, but, there, but you could see um, that, that the, some members of the fraction of, of the Green Party, or of the Green um, uh, Parliamentary Group, they reacted to the citizens' initiative. So you had like this, this coalition forming here, um, calling for change. Right. Um, so this is something you, you can observe definitely here. So it's mostly uh, members of European Parliament, um, but it's also it's sometimes it was also national groups or national governments that became allies of certain citizens initiatives. Uh, that, that also happened, actually, such as in the case of the Czech Republic. But that was because they were afraid of electoral uh, um, of electoral punishment if they did not ban caged hens, for example. Thank you. You're um, most welcome. Let's take uh, uh, Anna. So please introduce yourself. As I said, you've already been, uh, been mm -hmm. mentioned, and then uh, you may ask. Hello. Me. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Pleased um, to meet you, Anna. I didn't know that you're in the audience, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I received the email a couple of days ago, and I read it, and I was like, OK, that's going to be super interesting. And it is. It was really uh, interesting. I, I really like the approach that you take and uh, that you, you, you go uh, and focus on the initiatives, the initiative, let's say afterlife. So exactly. after they, yeah. they and it calls for, um, I think it calls for a broader uh, reconceptualization of, of success in, in the research on, on, on citizens' initiatives uh, in general. Um, what, uh, building on also on, on the, the previous questions, I, am, I would like to, I haven't read the paper because I received it like a couple of hours ago, I'm sorry. So perhaps these um, aspects are mentioned uh, there already. Uh, just uh, if you could, uh, if you had look at those and you could uh, share a couple of, of insights on, on how these, um, the alliances that, mm -hmm. that we talked about and, and whether you noticed any kind of, of alliances across levels. Mm -hmm. And I'm perhaps um, like I haven't looked into that aspect, but from reading on the paper of the papers, perhaps we could see some parliamentarians from yeah. members of the European Parliament from particular parties, whether they were involved in national citizens initiatives or if you noticed any such trends that would be um, helpful in explaining yeah. how the levels were linked and also the role that you mentioned before the role of, of public opinion if you have looked at this um, mm -hmm. the interaction these dynamics at the national level European level or, or local level mm -hmm. so thank you Great questions and I hope I did your research justice in my presentation and um, it's uh, 
uh, Yanis Papadopoulos loves it. Um, and um, so, uh, and, and we are all pretty much convinced by it. Not pretty much, we are fully convinced right. by it. So yeah, it's great really to meet you here. And um, the cross-level alliances are actually interesting. Um, first of all, France is, is a country where you observe them rather often. Um, where where you have like also national parliamentarians uh, that participate, um, not directly, they are not organizers, but they kind of support these initiatives usually, because I think officially it cannot be parties, although I need to look this up. You may actually know this better yourself, but France has this uh, cross-level structure quite a bit. Um, it had it a lot with banned glyphosate, for example. Where we also have a cross-level uh, political alliance structure is now with Safe Bees and Farmers. It's mostly run by Germans. So it, uh, the Eco Institute in Munich is affiliated with the Green Party and the Green Party was um, was one of the main organizers together with a very small party, Ecological Democratic Party. If you haven't heard of it any, any time before, it's normal. <laughs> it's a very small party in Germany, which which only organizes referenda. So they, that's, that's what they do. They just organize citizens' initiatives. And, and this is actually the group which originally comes from Bavaria that tried to bring this issue onto the federal agenda, didn't work out initially. Now it worked out, but via the EU route, interestingly. And then and they approached European partners and formed this, this coalition and the European Citizens Initiative, actually, kind of bypassing the federal state because the federal state or, uh, or the federal government was not responsive initially. And now it became responsive because of this horizontal diffusion in, in Germany for biodiversity legislation and pesticide bans, but also because they, they, they have seen that at the European level a lot is taking place and that there's also this initiative. So now we have a new nature protection law actually <laughs> in response to this. So I think Germany and France are two examples. And in terms of public opinion, the problem with public opinion is uh, it's hard to find data which um, which, which is uniform for the different levels, right? It's so difficult to have public opinion data for the subnational level, for example, for the national or the European level. I mean, you can see climate change has increased in importance, right? So therefore I would think this is perhaps also the reason why, um, why the soil theme has re-entered the European agenda because with the green agenda and with public demand for environmental protection and so the, the, the circumstances are just more favorable right now. But the problem is really if you apply our logic and try to, to link it to public opinion, the subnational level is difficult to, to capture with public opinion data. It's easier with national or with the European level in particular, but you can see, I mean, in Germany, um, but I think also at the European level, more generally climate, environmental issues, these are these are the hot topics, or they have been before Corona came along, <laughs> and, and now they're kind of becoming important again. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, I mean, it's wonderful that uh, people can, who are working <laughs> on the topic can connect through our online seminar from Greece and China. That's really amazing. Um, I have a couple of yeah. in between questions and comments. Um, and they, both of them really have to do with, um, you know, how you frame and locate mm -hmm. the, uh, the analysis. So, um, I mean, in the paper, you know, you talk about uh, veto points or, uh, or agenda setting, and it, it, it's pretty apparent that, um, you know, compared to a referendum on an existing law or treaty, um, a, a citizen's initiative belongs to a different uh, category because it has agenda setting. And in that sense, the, um, the veto points is a red herring, uh, more or less, for the uh, the paper, and so the, the the question is, you know, how how to frame it. You frame mm -hmm. it partly in terms of direct democracy. You frame it partly in terms of yeah. input uh, into uh, policy making, and that all makes uh, some sense. But I could I could also be questioned in some yeah. respects because I, I mean the, the the question and you kind of alluded to this, is to what extent this is a fundamentally different 
phenomenon than normal uh, NGO, civil society, um, social movement uh, campaigns. Because um, you know, I'm sure when mm -hmm. you look into the coalitions, all of these organized groups play a part. You said a little bit about um, uh, about parties, and I, although you know the the um, the fact that it has to be multinational within the EU creates some additional hurdles. As you point out, uh, on a population basis compared to Switzerland, this is a relatively low threshold. So, I, I mean, while it is an opportunity uh, mm -hmm. offered by um, the EU under the Lisbon Treaty to groups to mobilize and to put things on the, uh, the agenda, the question is whether, whether we shouldn't really frame it uh, in the, the broader um, category of pressure, uh, mm -hmm. politics, and um, attempts to influence uh, EU policy. And there's the whole literature about the yeah. as, a, as a responsive technocracy that has, has developed, uh, for example. So I'm not really sure that the direct yeah. policy part is the, is the best way to, uh, to think about this. Yeah. Um, and then the, 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 the second uh, point that I wanted to raise, which I, I, I also goes in the direction of trying to locate this in mm -hmm. a, a broader literature or a broader set of problems, has to do with the mechanisms of influence. And as you say, you, you've put forward a descriptive model. I haven't read the, uh, the Greenwood work which looks at basically the, the alliances, That's a, but I can guess a bit uh, what that is. But still, the question that would be interesting is what are the mechanisms through which um, the, uh, the citizens' initiatives uh, have the effects? And you would want to determine whether they really have effects, let's say, through process tracing, but that would also be an opportunity to investigate the mechanisms of the fact. And here, you know, I immediately start to think of the kinds of discussions that, um, uh, you know, we have been having for 15 years about European policy coordination and how that influences mm -hmm. European and national uh, policy making, starting with the open method of coordination, going yeah. on to the um, uh, the European semester, both of which I've worked on, but there is also the uh, the so-called usages of Europe uh, school. Um, Cornelia Wall, Sophie Jacques, yeah. um, uh, they've done it mostly for Europeanization. So how um, looking, uh, for example, how developments at the EU level are picked up and used by domestic uh, actors. And so, uh, you know, using the, the legitimation effects mm -hmm. are clearly important. The leverage effects, um, people have talked about, um, for example, recommendations from the commission uh, in, in the open method of coordination as a selective yeah. amplifier for domestic reform. And uh, people have also talked about, I mean, about creative appropriation of uh, these um, European uh, commitments or this added legitimacy by actors uh, at uh, at different kinds of uh, of subnational levels or even within different parts of the European uh, institution. So I think you could also mm -hmm. frame it in that sort of way, and that would uh, would lead you to focusing on yeah. identifying mechanisms of influence which may work in, in different spheres and where detailed process tracing would enable you to yeah. identify were these mechanisms present? Did they work in the way uh, that they've been theorized? Are there other mechanisms that haven't been previously identified and theorized? So I think that would you know, make, make it a less particularistic uh, topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is great. Uh, so if, if I may rephrase your, your suggestion, it would be to transform it into a governance story, right? A bit more? Yeah, a story about the intersection between governance and politics. Governance and politics, yeah. And, and also, yeah. Goes beyond classic uh, governance yeah. analysis. 
governance and politics. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, because yeah, I actually thought about your work also on experimental governance and uh, and the open method of coordination. That was actually something um, I, I wanted to consult for 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 the next iteration of the paper. Uh, but that's great. Um, I agree because also like when. When when we worked on on the paper, the the veto point story kind of crumbled, if you like, right? So um, it, it's clear that it's it's perhaps a too naive understanding of, of what what uh, what the literature thinks of of uh, these uh, these initiatives or direct democracy. And and I think the, the the paper could have more appeal and could make a more meaningful contribution by by locating it or positioning it in that literature so i'm i'm very pleased that you that you pointed this out so i fully subscribe to that i think that's definitely um that's definitely a change we're going to make and also your first, uh, your first point um it's it is actually one where i think i seem to have understood that you that you would us uh, that you would like us to mention explicitly that we're interested in the advocacy right it is in in the end a paper on advocacy and how you advocate policies right I, yeah. you could, could put it in that way but if we think that ngo mobilization and lobbying is an indirect form of mm. democracy and that citizens initiatives are a direct form of democracy. Yeah. I think that's misleading. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see, I see. Okay. So it also yeah. in some ways it's it's a political theory point as well. I see, I see. No, but it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hold on, I just need to write this down. That's very useful. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take these points. That's amazing. I mean, that was exactly what I had hoped for for this paper because it's a more conceptual paper. Others are more empirical, um, but this one is m more conceptual. You and I can correspond about the references in, in question. That's easy enough. Is there anyone else who wants to make a uh, to raise another question or um, make another comment? Maybe in that case, I can just ask you one very speculative uh, question about our common interest in uh, uh, in pesticide regulation, which has been surprisingly, uh, I mean, you know, among the the most high profile target. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you probably are aware, you know, glyphosate is coming up for reauthorization. It is in the reauthorization or renew process at the moment and um, the uh, the so-called um, uh, well the it is the review has been entrusted to I can't remember there's four or five national uh, authorities and they have produced a uh, already a report and um, it basically gives glyphosate a relatively clean bill of health. If you if you thought of them as a jury, and it was an indictment, so it's like glyphosate is uh, is cleared of um, uh, being a human carcinogen. It's cleared of being an endocrine disruptor. It's cleared of a number of other charges. The the charges that are upheld is that it lasts in water. And it's a problem that it collects in water. And you should be very careful not to get it in your eyes. <laughs> so, um, you know, clearly, uh, then this report is going to have to be peer reviewed within uh, EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, so the other um, uh, national uh, authorities that deal with um, uh, with pesticides will have to, to, to weigh in on, on the study. If EFSA then approves the report, it will go to the commission, it will go to this um, comitology uh, committee. And so what, what would you expect to happen now um, if, you know, again, let's say the, um, uh, the, the, the regulatory science people are coming and giving glyphosate a clean bill of health, then they're going to be these uh, representatives of the national administrations, we're going to have to take a position on it in light of all of these referenda and um, 
you know, uh, commitments to ban glyphosate if it's reauthorized. Uh, what would be your guess at how this is going to pay, play out uh, politically? I, I don't think that there will be a majority for renewing the authorization. First answer, because the last time there was a majority for it was because of Germany. Since the Minister of Agriculture, he deviated from the coalition agreement and he, he's very pro-farmers. Um, that was the only reason why there was a clear verdict in favor of reauthorization. Otherwise, there would have been a no, a no opinion scenario, right? Which would have left the commission in a very difficult situation. I think like from, from a practical viewpoint, authorizing it last time was actually the best thing to do because it gave farmers and also um, national governments uh, the uh, well an opportunity to work on a phase out plan right um the next german government is very likely to include the green party uh, also very likely to include the social democrats and perhaps even the left party we'll see um i don't think germany is going to vote in favor of a glyphosate uh, and even if it was for the CDU um, to be the leader of, of the next German coalition government, which is which looks quite unlikely now, it's such an it, it, it's emotionally so con like so contested, so contagious that um, not even the CDU could get away with could um, could kind of vote in favor of the reauthorizing uh, glyphosate despite of the scientific effects. So I think there is an, a, a massive uh, emotional component um, and, and, and I don't think it's likely that glyphosate will be, um, will, that, the, that the authorization will be renewed. Well, yeah. that would be my guess too. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's going to be, it does not happen very often that there is a, a you know, a, a clear recommendation yeah. from an EU agency for risk assessment and that it is rejected in the uh, by by a qualified majority. Yeah. In, in fact, I'm not sure there are any other cases. No, although I mean, with GMOs also, I mean, you also have evidence ruling out clearly the the health effects, for example, right? Uh, but GMOs is again different because it's really product by product, and here it's one substance. So um, the cases the cases are a bit different. But no, I think um, it's. Um, I think the emotional component will definitely uh, be more important than the than the scientific facts, uh, or I mean, facts or the, the findings or the report. Um, in this case, we don't need to. May, yeah. I'm, many of us are really qualified to adjudicate. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Julie wants to chime in <laughs> here. Are you are you not able? Oh, from Singapore. Wow. Yeah. Um, Julie, do you want to ask your question yourself? Um, sorry, I hope y'all can hear me okay. Um, yeah. Apologies if there's yeah. any sort of confusion on the line. Yeah, I haven't read anything to do with um, endocrine disruption for years, but just judging from my old memory, this, I was working in the European Parliament when God was young. But, <laughs> um, I seem to remember that yeah. we specifically put in a provision about um, ensuring that the commission investigate very clearly and the commission agreed to mm -hmm. on anything to do with endocrine disruptors, knowing that back then we didn't have enough information about yeah. it and that studies would be coming out subsequently. If yeah. you need to refer to an institution, meaning that was the environment committee back then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as being overly supportive, hyper supportive of the position of the precautionary principle mm -hmm. use the European Parliament's environment committee. It went through conciliation yeah. and Parliament yeah. won on that point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, with the last round, it would have been more plausible to refer to the precautionary principle because there there was indication that uh, that there might be a carcinogenic effect of of glyphosate, but now with the new report having multiple, it's five authorities, right, Jonathan, that tested. Yeah. Well, they didn't test it. They, yeah. they, oh, they assessed. It's a meta analysis. It's it's a uh, review of what's out there. Yeah. You know the, yeah. the producers of glyphosate have submitted new 
uh, dossiers. And they have also, then the committee has um, reviewed supposedly 7,000 scientific studies and come to these conclusions. But we don't really know how they weighted those yeah. Uh, yeah. And there is a kind of issue about uh, whether the conditions under which the clinical trials are done um, are the same as the conditions that you would find in, uh, in real life. Um, and the scientific studies, the academic studies typically don't follow good li laboratory practice. That's the thing, it's yeah. only yeah. followed by the... Um, uh, the the, uh, the 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 studies which are commissioned by business also because they're very expensive to uh, to do, um, and so it could be that um, you know there are finding studies that show glyphosate being carcinogenic, uh, but which are re re down are, are given a lower weighting by the uh, evaluating authorities because they're not carried out under these uh, good laboratory mm -hmm. uh, practice. I, I've only seen the summary um, of the report and I've, uh, I've corresponded a bit with the, um, uh, the a Dutch official who I think was involved in it, who, who got in touch with me after we published this uh, op-ed piece in, in EU Observer, which was, was interesting. But so far, the whole thing is very quiet. I mean, I was yeah. expecting, if you'll excuse the expression, I, I mean, I think this is going to trigger off an absolute shitstorm. Mm. Um, same, same here. At the yeah. moment, um, you know, the, the bomb has been detonated, but it hasn't gone off yet. Yeah, it's interesting. I was also struck by it, but I think perhaps because there is agreement or at least an understanding among most businesses, Germany is affected quite badly by this, also because of Monsanto belonging to Bayer now. Um, I think that was the worst business decision of all times <laughs> by, by, by Bayer to, to, to buy Monsanto. But uh, yeah, I think there is this understanding. Germany now also has a phase out strategy, right? Uh, that this is this, that this has an ending date yeah so we'll see but in principle i yeah. mean glyphosate as an active ingredient is reauthorized at the european level any um unilateral decision by a member state or a um, uh, or a subnational unit to ban it uh, would be in contravention of, of absolutely yeah unilateral bans are actually not feasible well, legally speaking, yeah. Although we yeah. know from GMOs that yeah. uh, um, what is not feasible legally may nonetheless be possible. possible and also politically um, desirable sometimes, yeah. <laughs> well, this is, it will be interesting to keep in touch on this issue. Absolutely. Yeah, but I really think if you look at how, how people, like how emotionally they react to glyphosate even now, um, I don't think any... What, not even a conservative party could get away with it, I think. Not, not even them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing we, I, I'll just close here, that we found that we didn't really do anything with in, uh, in, in our survey. And I mean, we don't discuss it in the report, partly because we discovered it um, relatively late in the process, is that um, there are big differences among uh, the countries in terms of glyphosate awareness. Um, I mean, nearly half our of the people in our study, so that's um, basically 9,000 people in, um, uh, in, in six member states had heard of glyphosate. We were surprised it was so high, but actually that was a little bit skewed because yeah. In Germany and France, more than 90% of the yeah. people that they had heard of it. And in the other countries, it was more than like um, 20%. They still had views about it, interesting. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> you probably analyze that, um, that difference and how it plays out also in people's uh, views uh, in a subsequent uh, iteration. Because it is, I mean, it's, it's obviously irrelevant. Uh, yeah.
We should definitely stay in touch. I'm also in the process of launching a survey experiment, but with a communication scientist where we look at how the, the, the cues used by the central campaign are perceived by different cultures, right? So whether Italians perceive of certain images differently invoked by these uh, initiatives, like for example, in Germany, a bee is a very like positively connoted animal. So if you have a bee, people think of it positively. And also um, if you use other adjectives that, that they kind of frighten people. So is this, just, is this just a German thing or is this something that you can also observe in Italy? And uh, so um, we're working on this right now and we want to look at two initiatives. One is Stop Glyphosate uh, because it's a very polarized issue or controversial issue. And, and we're currently looking for a second one. So let's see which one will qualify for it. But uh, but I, I would be happy to liaise with you on, on that project as well. well let's keep uh, keep in touch. The expert on survey and conjoined yeah. methodology is, uh, is Teresa. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we thank you and we thank the, the audience.